Next, the award-winning writer James Graham. He's famous for his works on stage and screen, and in his new upcoming work, Dear England, turns his focus to football. It's set for release this summer, and it tells the story of how Gareth Southgate revived the fortunes of the national team. It explores themes of identity, masculinity and racism, as well as the public backlash the team suffered when taking on political and social issues. James, thanks for coming on the show. Thank and um, let's start with the big news this week about your new play about Gareth Southgate and what you call the gentle revolution he's been leading. What's the revolution you're talking about and why did you want to turn that into a drama? I, think I just love any, any national institution or any system that at, at the time of its greatest stress, someone comes in and disrupts it and changes it and they either succeed or they fail. And I think if you think back, it feels like a long time ago because of the success of what Gareth has done, if you go back all the way to 2016, mm. it, like England was at the absolute lowest ebb. Mm. And then he goes on this huge journey where he wasn't just talking about performance uh, and results. Uh, I think he was talking about something much, much bigger about spirit and soul and character and identity. What is it to be a young English man in the 21st century? What is it to be English? And, and the name of the play Dear England is based on this open letter that he wrote in 2021 to, to not just England fans, but to the nation. And it, it was a really political letter, wasn't it? Was that the inspiration for you? That wasn't the inspiration. I've been thinking about this for uh, a few years, almost ever since, and I don't want to reduce his mission down to this, but if we remember, England had never won a penalty shootout in the World Cup before. We were like one of the worst in the world at penalties, at our own game that we invented, and no one could figure out why. And obviously Gareth himself has a personal memory of what it is to miss a penalty. And then he broke that curse in Russia in 2018 for the first time. And I think that was symptomatic of something bigger going on culturally mm. in the English game. He's quite political, would you say? I, I don't know if he's... I mean, I think he's, an un, he's not afraid of the, of the idea that football can be more than just sport or that a football player can be more than just a, an, an athlete, that they can represent something, they can be a role model. And when you look at anything from Marcus Rashford to what Raheem Sterling and people have been doing, finding a voice and inserting themselves into politics, he's not afraid of that. But to me, my growing understanding of Gareth is that his vibe is really, he's an introvert anyway, and it's quite internal. And what he's trying to draw out of his players is something bigger. And if that's, if your world experience is, is you've experienced racism, then why can't the game own that? Why can't you talk about that if that's your life? So he's, yeah, he's, yeah, political. The most prominent expression of Southgate's revolution, if you like, quite rev was, was the team taking the knee. Yeah. Uh, before games, and it became this woke political statement in the, the minds of some people. And Lee Anderson, now deputy uh, chair of the Conservative Party, was so incensed by this that he said he was not going to watch the games. And you might sort of disagree with that, James, but does, do, you, do you accept that he speaks for a lot of England, that Lee Anderson does, and that, that, that Southgate doesn't? Uh, well, he, he's my MP, Lee Anderson, from, from Ashfield, yeah. and I, I, uh, I watched that happening. Um, I, I don't want to dismiss it, because like you say, maybe there is a part of the country that feels the same. I think it's interesting that he, he was often criticising the players for performative virtue signalling, and I mm. equally think you could accuse Lee Anderson of doing the same. That was quite a performative mm. bit of polit po populist politicking he did. Mm. Just on sort of... Southgate's view, though, the racism that spilled out after Rashford, Saka and Sancho missed those penalties in the Euros, and they, they did sort of re dis reflect, if you like, a disconnect between Southgate's modern take on the game mm. and how he saw it and the reality of perhaps how some of the fans did and the yeah. sort of sickening attitudes of some of the fans. Yeah, it was, it, it, we all remember that and it was incredibly upsetting and disgusting and I guess a lot of that stuff we felt had been had been buried, some of those ghosts, and but they're always sort of there in president and, and I think what I find um, comforting and inspiring about that moment though is how those basically young lads still, those young men, took a breath, took a moment and collectively mm. responded with such grace and such articulation and such decency. 
I think that is symptomatic of what is going on in that team. The history of England often has been one of these men not quite surviving some of the incredible pressures that are put on their shoulders. I thought the way they articulated it was just really beautiful. You've written so many uh, plays and screenplays. You're arguably Britain's most celebrated political playwright and screenwriter. And did you set out when you were at Asheville Comprehensive School to, to be who you have now become? Oh my God, no. Yeah. I had a big comprehensive school in a poor area. But for whatever reason, my drama teacher decided that working class kids should do theatre and not have any stigma to it. And, and I just fell in love. I fell in love with entertaining and, and storytelling. Um, and that's why it was the, the genuine privilege of my life to be able to do Sherwood last year, which was a story set in a red wall town. I think the red wall often is like a, it's like a black hole, like a lot of light and energy goes into it, but very little comes out of it. Do you think that we focus sufficiently on class? And do you think we should be talking about class more than we do? We don't remotely know how to talk about class, particularly in the arts, I think. And I think because we're squeamish about it, because we don't quite know how to define it, I get squeamish about it, talking about it now, because I think, am I a fraud? Because I, I know I come from a working class background, but now I'm a playwright with plays in the West End, and my income has changed from what my parents was. Am I now no longer working class? Mm -hmm. Therefore, can you not have a working class playwright? And yeah. I think the problem of definition is, is, is part of it. Um, but you're right, like even like BAFTA has been really incredible and really brilliant um, in recent years about having a real focus on underrepresented groups and making sure that people, that voters are really aware of that. They have my sympathy with the fact that one of the only metrics that they don't know how to measure yet mm. is class. So it's not mentioned when people vote for a film or vote for a TV drama. But BAFTA came into a bit of criticism, didn't it? In the Because there was lots of ethnic diversity in yeah. terms of the nominations, but actually what came out was, I don't think, any ethnic diversity in no, terms I mean, of winners, it, right? It was disgraceful. It was 100% white winners, and that is not yeah. representative of the countries that are making the art. And I think, I think, I, I, I slightly feel for BAFTA. I think, I, I think they would have been confused and disappointed without speaking on their behalf, because they have put real effort and systems in place to make sure that underrepresented stories get, get more yeah. recognition. But there's still a human element that you can't control, and I imagine they're going to have to think about that. Talking about Sherwood, I want to talk as a poster there, your hit TV series, crime drama. I'm sure lots of people will be excited to know that a second series is coming mm. back. Will the second run, like the first, be based on real life events? It will be inspired by things that have happened, yes. Yeah. So, so the first series took, um, it was inspired by some, some killings that took place in my village a few doors down from where I lived. Mm. And they, uh, even though they weren't remotely politically motivated, uh, because of the, the tensions and the politics of a town ripped apart by the miners' strike 30 years previously, people projected onto it politics that weren't there and it reopened those old wounds. And I was living in the community at the time and I really remember how upsetting it was to see the Met Police return to the community, mm. the same police force that had tormented this town and, and exacerbated those divisions. People were really upset by that. The season two's come at a time when industrial action with strikes in yeah. schools and transport networks, the NHS and beyond are so prevalent in our national consciousness. Will those subjects feature in your next yeah, series? I, I think so, yeah. Well, it was, it was so strange because obviously TV dramas take a very long time to write and then yeah. produce. So I began the first series of Sherwood about three years ago. And I couldn't believe actually that what emerged during the, the production and the broadcast about the last great national strike was was this industrial action which we've not seen on a scale since so obviously something is in the in the ether or the zeitgeist and similarly i think in particular leveling up and regional inequality uh, and um, the lack of investment in the east midlands in particular uh, will be a political firework in the in the show and in particular um I can't believe this has happened, but I, obviously in relation to the real life reopening, opening yeah. of a brand new mine in Cumbria, uh, one of the story points in Sherwood 2 will be a consultation about reopening a pit in Nottinghamshire and whether that's what the community want or is that just holding on to a heritage that's passed. So, so it's going to feature the reopening of a mine, so Good. it kind of ties... 
yeah. ties the past to the present. Exactly. I think well, I think what was really um, was really grateful for that the, 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 the affection for the first series seemed to be not about the, the crime drama elements. It was essentially a story about community and yeah. how painful it is when a political choice is inserted into a community and divides it. And the minor strike was basically pre remain leave in terms of splitting families and sp splitting friends and I still find it very upsetting it, it's still the case that people will cross the street from someone who made a different political choice or families brothers and sisters can't speak to each other because they were forced to make this choice you have become a chronicler if you like of the red wall um, and it's a theme that as you say has taken on huge political significance sort of driven by Boris Johnson and red wall and leveling up uh, and around Brexit, and about Brexit being this conduit in which there was an argument that forgotten communities thought this was a way of taking back control, yeah. to, to use the parlance of, of, of Boris Johnson. Do you feel that the community you came from, that these communities are represented accurately in our political discourse? No, not at all, and that's why I think drama comes in, because that the tendency, I think, in political discourse, of course, is to imagining these communities as one single homogenous block of uniform opinion. And in Ashfield, there are, you know, there's Remain voters and Leave voters. There are working class people, middle class people, probably upper class people, though I've never met them. Um, there, are, there are liberals and there are social conservatives and people are complicated and contradictory and fluid, actually. Looking at the future of the Red Wall, do you think that political events like Partygate, the cost of living crisis, the current strikes over public sector pay. Yeah. Do you think it will change opinion again in seats like Ashfield, where Lee Anderson is now representing your community? Definitely. It definitely cut through. When I, when I, I spend a lot of time there um, now, gloriously, back with my family and friends because of Sherwood and it being set in that community, mm. um, there's no question in my mind that certainly Partigate cut through and the feeling of uh, injustice that people made sacrifices that it was it's perceived that um the people in power didn't so something is changing and shifting i've got no idea whether it will uniformly go back to um to labor do you think lee anderson is too ideological then for the people of ashfield because he doesn't seem like a pragmatist to me i mean he would definitely have his have his fans but i also know people are, people don't necessarily enjoy um the stirring, I guess they would call it, someone who, who, who is, who is um, deliberately trying to disrupt uh, something. And there's, um, there's, you know, my communities and places like them, there's a resistance to, I think, show-offs, people call them. Uh, and there'd be a sense of, some people would think he needs to wind his neck in a bit and, and focus more on, on policy rather on these culture wars. And Lee would disagree. Yeah, and he would go, look, I'm trying to represent the viewpoints of my town. All I would say to Lee is there's, there, there, there is not a uniform, consistent view that comes from these places. And you can never claim to fully and completely represent them because you'll only ever be re representing one side. Do you think side. the seat will go Labour again next election then? I genuinely don't know. But I think according to all the polling, it's going to be incredibly close. So I hope you'll be there in Ashford on I'm election sure night. I'd love to be there with you. Well, I, and I'm looking forward to watching uh, your next play you. and your next series of shows. So thank you, James, for seeing us today. Thanks, Appreciate Beth. it. Cheers.